All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the deputy director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, thanks, as always, for taking the time to join us for another speaker in our lecture series. It's my sincere pleasure today to welcome Dr. Ivanka Bartoshka uh, for her talk titled Integrating AI and Wargaming Opportunities and Challenges. Uh, her talk is based, I mean, on her work that she's done over the last few years, um, but also on an article she wrote recently for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And I'm going to put the link down in the chat as we get rolling here today. So you can look at that article um, while you're while you're watching her go through her slides. I'm not going to go into the details of what her talk specifically is going to cover. I'm just going to say as a scene setter that strategic war gaming is something that the Center for Global Security Research has been very focused on over the last few years. Um, we've attempted to bring in some speakers from the outside to talk about, you know, this field, this analytic tool with a broader audience here at the National Laboratory. If you are interested in the topic, if you're interested in the talk that she's going to give, I would also just recommend to you a presentation that was done by Sebastian Bay here on October 2nd, where he was talking about wargaming design. And that talk is up on the CGSR webpage uh, under the lecture series tab. Let me say a little bit about the speaker. Um, Ivanka is the co-founder and CEO of Strand Analytica, which is a US-UK defense startup committed to the secure and ethical use of technology in strategic analytic wargaming for national security and defense. She was the founding director of the Wargaming Network at King's College London, which was also dedicated to the establishing wargaming as an academic discipline. Um, she has a background in physics and international relations, and she's worked at the intersection of technology and strategy and developing um, wargaming met methodology and epistemology for a long time. Um, she's consulted with the UK Ministry of Defense, and she's provided testimony to the UK Parliament. For those of you um, who are new to the CGSR lecture series, the ground rules, the speaker is going to deliver her remarks for about 30 to 45 minutes, at which point we're going to open the floor up for a moderated question and answer session. Please get your hands up electronically using the WebEx function. Please submit your questions to me in the chat function. Um, feel free to get those up as early as you, as you want as the discussion rolls on, and that way I can kick up a discussion very, very quickly. Um, once she concludes her remarks. So, Ivanka, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, look, looking forward to this talk, and I'll go ahead and put the article um, shit link here in the chat. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and, and thank you um, uh, for having me uh, back at Livermore today. Um, I come to this topic as both a scholar and a practitioner. So our, our startup is actively involved in R&D on analytical wargaming, particularly strategic wargaming and artificial intelligence. Um, just as a caveat, I won't be able to say too much about the specific technologies because uh, we're working on those with, with government partners. But I will uh, talk about the broader landscape, um, the opportunities and the challenges um that i see in being able to leverage uh these these tools effectively um and as mike mentioned um i also come to this topic as as a scholar uh working on the foundations of wargaming um trying to establish that as um uh, particularly analytical wargaming is a more um scientifically credible um, endeavor and a serious field of academic study. Um, so this is <clears throat> an important um, thread that you will see um, <clears throat> through this talk and and through the articles that uh, that that Mike has shared. So we are at a critical junction. And I think the just seeing the number of people that have signed up for the talk, um, this is another data point on why uh, these two domains of wargaming and artificial intelligence are so um, important and promise a shift because they promise a shift in strategic advantage for years to come. So individually, both of these fields hold potential. 
So war games allow us to test strategies and tactics without having to face the real world consequences. Um, AI, on the other hand, provides us with computational power to analyze vast amount of data um, to uncover valuable patterns that humans just can't. Uh, but when thoughtfully integrated and with uh, careful consideration of issues like transparency, bias, and ethics, uh, I believe the fusion of war gaming and AI has the potential to greatly enhance strategic decision making. So in the next hour, um, I'll talk about these scenarios. So these are three scenarios over which I think are plausible over the next two to five years, starting with the reality that wargaming and AI are often kept separate um, due to differing approaches and perspectives. I'll then talk about the potential for AI wargaming integration before delving into some of the, the technological uh, scientific and ethical challenges that arise when uh, we're combining um, both of these without proper oversight. And lastly, I'll briefly touch about uh, touch on the um, the possibility of AI takeover. Um, as investment pours into the tech sector, and machines outperform human players. Um, I think this is still a probable scenario, um, even in the next five years that that we we all. Um, so I have here <clears throat> images of the two articles that have that have just come out. Um, Mike has sent you the link. If you can't uh, access them, uh, also please feel to feel free to um, um, to email me and and I can send you. Um, send you the articles. So I'm not going to talk to um, um, a lot of slides. Um, I just have two tables that I will I will show you later on in the talk. Um, but so let's get started by looking at the expectations that. US leaders have set out for war gaming and for reinvigorating uh, war gaming um, before exploring why bringing AI into the mix can, can deliver strategic advantage. So senior leaders have had high hopes for what war gaming can accomplish. And so these expectations have spanned three areas. Um, the first area is driving bold innovation. So in, in 2015, Ash Carter um, sparked a wargaming revival. Um, you know, he said, um, I mean, at the time, America must write a new playbook to counter aggression by countries like Russia and China. And wargaming can help with that uh, if done right. Uh, because it should spur innovation. So point one, driving bold innovation. Now, following the US lead, NATO has said, we want to develop an audacious wargaming capability. What does audacious mean? Um, audacious wargaming stands for a culture shift that encourages critical thinking experimentation, uh, cross-pollination of, of ideas and military strategy and planning um, for the alliance to be able to gain strategic adv advantage. So innovation. Um, the second expectation is that is for rigorous ballistic analysis. Um, so military commanders use war games to analyze potential campaign plans, um, courses of action 
must be feasible and acceptable when tested in, you know, basically a simulated clash of red and blue capability and wills. But DOD is also looking for department wide cross game analysis and a more global strategic perspective. Um, so this uh, enhanced analytical function is 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 a big uh, big point. Um, so finally, uh, what war games should achieve is improving real world real world success. Ultimately, the, the Pentagon intends war gaming, uh, and this is uh, said in the in the in the in the. 2015 memo, uh, wargaming should avoid operational and technological surprise, make our forces more successful in future conflicts. Um, so war games do need to help ensure this real world success. So this ambition, ambitious vision presume wargaming can deliver innovation, analytical rigor uh, to help deter and win real world conflicts. So where are we today? Wargaming and artificial intelligence, uh, they're both promising spheres, but they've been traveling on parallel tracks because they've been hindered by disparate tools, mindsets, and leadership preferences. So the first point here is that you know, the methods differ fundamentally. Um, War games rely on human ingenuity. The outcomes of these games hinge on participant insights. Um, in AI systems, on the other hand, um, the focus is on uh, data analysis, learning optimal solutions, and finding patterns and in, in information. So the one emphasizes war, war games emphasize the role of human. Um, human expertise. Um, secondly, war games and AI are practiced by separate communities with distinct skill sets. Um, and these communities also have differing views on how knowledge ought to be produced. These are two distinct cultures. So one sees the benefit of an artistic, human-led approach that is centered around intuition and creativity. Um, the tech community, on the other hand, prioritizes science and quantitative rigor. Now, on top of that, you have um, technologists uh, that working on um, these specific applications that that also bring their own um, distinct cultural views. So these cultural barriers, I mean, they breed skepticism. Um, these tribes are competing for resources, and they're also competing for for policy influence. So the se separation between the wargaming and the simulation communities has been has been around for a while. Um, so third, you know, while we're seeing machines be chess masters, um, our senior leaders still prefer hands-on problem solving. Um, so senior decision makers have more confidence in war games activities they have personally participated in rather than you know an analysis done behind closed doors in an academic um you know setting so leaders still prefer war games over complex models so despite this immense potential for collaboration uh war gaming and AI has continued to progress independently. Um, there are forces driving toward convergence, but we have these tribal barriers that um, 
that create friction. So what would um, what factors will dictate this future trajectory? So we have incentives, leadership priorities, um, and I would say above all, um, imagination. So looking at um, the possibility of AI wargaming integration, um, you know, even while there's been this clash of clans between the wargaming and simulation communities, we're starting to see bridges being built between these groups. Um, and so we're seeing different projects exploring uh, the blending of AI and, and traditional wargaming. Um, so let me give you some examples. Uh, DARPA has backed new projects on human machine teaming for strategy simulations. Um, in the UK, we have the Defense Science and Technology Lab that has funded research um, into AI that to support both digital and manual war games. Um, both DARPA and ESDO's work, um, you can find some publications um, on this topic. Um, we also have researchers at RAND uh, who've been working on automating war games for strategy since you know, at least the 1980s. So this fusion really isn't new ground. Um, what is new is some of the advances in, in artificial intelligence, which really open up new possibilities for war gaming, which, which I'll also talk about uh, a bit later. Uh, so perhaps the best resource on this is a, re um, a recent survey done by experts um, in the UK at the Alan Turing um, Research Institute. So this is the, the UK's premier um, center for, for, for data science and NAI. So they found, um, uh, so what they did was they surveyed Wargaming experts and uh, and technologists and found some readily readily deployable AI solutions which could help with things like game logistics, capturing data, increasing player immersion. Um, so basically, useful gains without huge costs. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the report. Um, if you haven't already seen it, um, here on the screen is, um, is their distillation of some of the opportunities for AI integration into the different elements of, of game design. Now, this report also talks about some of the bleeding edge applications that might prove revolutionary. Um, but they also found that some of these just might be too expensive for the value that they, they promised to deliver. So, wargaming and AI modeling, they have different strengths, different limitations. But the core thing is that there are many options for targeted integration, and we ought to be exploring these, these seriously. Um, so let me go into some some examples. So take game design. Uh, we all know that scenarios and the hypotheticals um, that go into game content creation, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of creativity and craft. Um, and until now, that's meant relying solely on basically the brain power of talented humans. But here's where generative AI models, um, you know, such as ones that are already being used by commercial film industries, um, could help develop these kinds of new hypothetical scenarios. And current AI capable generative AI capabilities are ripe for this use because it just doesn't require factual precision. So we don't, we're not worried about AI hallucinating or basically getting things wrong if we're developing a hypothetical future scenario. 
Um, so in theory, you know, you can get a system um, like that to pump out thousands of scenario variants to test. Um, one of the DSTL studies explored this possibility, um, but such a volume could just be pointless because there are not, not enough folks to actually play these games. Um, but still, AI could stimulate innovation on tailoring war games to the kinds of questions that we're, we, need, um, we need to be answered today. So, game scenario, game content creation, um, current AI capabilities can contribute a lot for that. A second area, which, which is a lot more controversial, is player inputs. So, if we have tabletop exercises transitioning onto digital platforms, um, you could very easily incorporate AI into this fabric. So some of these DARPA gaming projects um, provide a glimpse of, of what that could look like. Um, you know, we have adversary bots that you could, you could create adversary red teams that you could pit against blue teams. Um, and so then these bots would essentially be replacing human players. Um, so you can have AI play red. Um, you could have AI replace human adjudicators. And it's, again, the capability is ripe for generative AI tools to provide outcomes or at least generate text that is an outcome based on player decisions. The, the question of accuracy and relevance um, is, is still a big issue and, and challenge there. Um, but then to evaluate whether the AI's contribution for, let's say, adjudication is useful, we need to benchmark that against human performance. So while, you know, the machine may occasionally produce incorrect responses, on the whole, you might say that the accuracy could rival, the, you know, that of experts um, that are assigned uh, to determine the impact of these, you know, complex player interaction interactions uh, in a very short time frame. Um, and you know short time frame is is key because a lot of a lot of these um, uh, adju the, the adjudication in war games often has to happen very quickly. Um, so ba based on that benchmark, um, AI could could even perform better. Um, so I mean all of this sounds, promising perhaps, but then we're starting to see a blending of simulation and gaming in ways, in ways that begins to remove um, the human element. So I think that's, that's the concern because at that point you're taking away um, the most valuable contribution of war gaming, which is eliciting human perspectives on on these kinds of topics. So when it comes to incorporating AI into war games, um, feasibility will depend on specific defense needs. And we can consider this across different um, different purposes and roles. So for example, for education and training, um, intelligent AI tutors could deliver immense, um, immense benefit in terms of personal, personalized instruction, um, improving the skills of, um, of officers, 
and while also saving resources. And you know, these functions are aligning with trends in education that are not just in professional military education, but um, uh, but but civilian education. In terms of analysis, um, I think both integrated and independent systems can offer significant gains. So you could have standalone simulations powered by AI that could you know, effectively test operational military plans with you know, very precise conclusions on strengths and weaknesses. Here, manual war games could still be useful, but only as low fidelity, basically paper prototypes, uh, but not as rigorous analytical tools due to their inherent limitations for data capture and analysis. However, um, when it comes to addressing strategic challenges, such as deterrence, um, human decisions are going to remain vital. So in this aspect, AI can serve as a valuable assistant by scanning data, by uncovering correlations, uh, but in the development of strategy, um, blended systems hold the most promise um, for accumulating insights over time, provided that we can establish frameworks that allow us to connect the dots between different games. So what I'm talking about here is, is the need for cumulative learning, and this is not current practice, but largely because these comprehensive meta-analysis frameworks don't exist. And so instead we have findings that are scattered and isolated in individual silos. Uh, but even simulations by enhanced AI, um, you know, could remain isolated from, from each other, but algorithms could facilitate comparison between insights gained by both types of systems even if the convergence remains partial. So ultimately, while wargaming will continue being more art than science, combining human intuition, um, targeted integration of AI can fill in some of these analytical gaps. And it's vital that we assess where a combination of human intelligence uh, and artificial intelligence can best serve defense needs um, because the answer is going to be different across education, analysis, or these strategic applications. So we talked about the, the opportunities. Uh, let me talk about some of the challenges that come with AI wargaming integration. Um, to reap the benefits, there's several challenges that are common, common to both AI and war games um, that need to be addressed. So first, uh, we must tackle the issue of this elusive black box problem. So we don't know how war games and deep models work, which can make it very difficult to trust their results. Um, and as it stands, we're unable to look into our systems and discern the reasoning behind their outputs. It takes a lot of skill and creativity to design both war games and neural networks. So the design process in both is somewhat of an art and they cannot simply be generated from a textbook formula um, because no 
overarching methodology really exists in, in either of, of these spheres. And this po poses a lot of issues for replicability, um, for peer review, um, in, and ultimately the, the credibility of establishing the credibility of these, these complex creations. Um, as many of you have seen, war game reports often focus on the input, which is the scenario, and then the output, which is the of a game, which is the, the game outcomes and the key insights. And, you know, often doesn't really go into an explanation for how these were de derived. And in fact, um, the common view in the professional wargaming community is that war games are not reproducible. Um, you also see that repeated in the new uh, NATO Wargaming Handbook that came out uh, this year. Uh, you see that in the UK Wargaming Handbook. I mean, this is, for war gamers, this is seen as a badge of, of honor and not uh, a serious issue that undermines war gaming's credibility. Um, so in the field of AI, there's a growing effort to demystify these black box algorithms. Um, so there's a lot of research going on in what, um, what people are calling explainability. Um, there's a lot of effort going into increasing transparency. On the wargaming side, um, there's very little attention to the advancement of wargaming theory, methodology, epistemology. Um, and there's a, only a handful of scholars that are uh, interested and have the resources to seriously work on these topics. Um, so this leaves room for potential misuse or misunderstanding of war games making the issue of explainability more urgent to um, as you know something that we just need we need to take on. Um, so the second challenge comes in in the potential bias, um, which can lead to inaccurate or misleading results. Um, so this bias can can come from the data um, and decisions that um, influence games and AI models, but it can also come from um, their designs and the people that um, that create them. So in wargaming, we know that small groups with shared mindsets playing out just a handful of runs can skew results. Um, adjudicators who don't have clear guidelines for um, how to derive or explain the outcome that they've um, they've developed. I mean, they they can fall prey to bias too. Um, and before long, you know, we have these false patterns emerging um, that can feel factual, but actually stem from flaws in how we've we've set up and run the game. Um, as we've seen, AI systems also amplify prejudice uh, present in the data that we're feeding these systems. Um, uh, there have been case studies um, that have been publicly reported um, on this, like Amazon's flawed hiring algorithm. But the thing is that whereas we're seeing these, these issues about AI being publicly discussed, talked about, um, and then pressures created on companies and their creators to, to find solutions. We just don't have the same, um, the same transparency and scrutiny for war games um, that uh, many of which are, are classified or, or simply not, not public. Um, now, another issue um, is that 
which compounds these concerns is that analytical games often blend educational are, are blended with educational goals. Um, so in a, in a survey that uh, we ran at King's College London, we found that um, a significant portion of war game designers do not make the distinction between analytical and educational war games. And we also see that leaders want simulations that both teach concepts and test theories. Uh, but fusing these goals with research really muddies um, their credibility and, and integrity. So, you know, in a university setting uh, where we have clear divides between teaching and research, such a practice would raise immediate red flags about academic integrity and, and ethics. Um, and, and this is not the case in um, in professional wargaming or or the policy world. So next, I mean, let me let me talk about the ethical concerns which persist in both wargaming and AI. And I'll, I'd like to spend some time on this because. Um, the issues are poorly understood and and have been overlooked. So the same study I mentioned, uh, the King's College study. Um, so this involved responses from over um, 140 war game designers from uh, nearly 20 countries. And the findings reported that 80% of self-reported analytical games, so games that people said, games that people had designed and said were analytical, 80% of those did not undergo ethics reviews. Um, and et, you know, ethics reviews, as, as most of you know, are, you know, this is a standard protocol for research studies involving human participants. This trend was also confirmed uh, on the UK side from um, with a Freedom of Information Act request um, to the Ministry of Defense Research Ethics Committee, uh, MODREC. So we asked them in the last five years how many applications for wargaming related research, you know, anything wargaming related have you had over the last five years? And they came back and said one. Um, I didn't expect the number to be very high, but but I was I was a bit shocked by by the single application that Mod Rec had received for the last five years on wargaming. So I think there's there's an issue there's an issue there. Um, why has there been such lack of oversight in wargaming? Uh, one of the contributing factors. Um, is that influential government guidance, you know, like the NATO handbook on wargaming, just doesn't mention ethics. Um, government sponsors rarely require uh, compliance with these formal research ethics uh, procedures. And, I mean, the main factor is that ethics approval is just a laborious and time consuming process, uh, which just conflicts with the urgency of, of policy deadlines. But we must consider the ethical implications of war games because um, they have the potential to both harm players um, and society. In talking about this issue with with people, uh, we found that many in the professional wargaming community weren't um, weren't well informed about the kinds of you know how ethics applies to their discipline. You know what what are the kinds of ethical issues they should be thinking about. Um, I mean, I'll I'll just quickly list some of these here. So you know, players may experience high levels of stress. Um, leading to you know aggressive behavior si similar to that in competitive sports. 
uh, you know, if identities are linked to game actions and discussions, you know, this could damage their professional rep reputations. Um, the, you know, the, the list for potential personal harm um, uh, goes on and these are, these are pitfalls that um, games address through careful protocols. Um, for society, uh, strategic war games can directly or indirectly impact real world decisions. And I mean, that's not just strategic war games, uh, but those who play these games and hold a position of power may be subtly influenced by their experiences. Um, and so the game can potentially be affecting future decisions in sub subtle ways that neither the player nor the designer really understands. So this is, you know, like having a participant in a medical trial who's had an adverse reaction to a drug make a decision on the drug's approval. I mean, take another example. So if, if a game, um, let's say, unintentionally portrays Russian leaders as overly aggressive, you know, due to some hidden bias in the design or scenarios, I mean, this could lead to misallocation of defense resources, you know, or, or even inadvertent escalation of conflict. So, I mean, it goes without saying that you know, it's such important decisions are not going to be made lightly and certainly not based on the results of a, a, a single game. However, as wargaming becomes more prevalent when you're dealing with large scale games with numerous players, these risks amplify. And, you know, basically scale matters and this is where the integration of AI with wargaming, which can massively augment this, um, the scale. That's how these risks get amplified. Um, I mean, so, so ethical risks in wargaming are currently overlooked at AI with all the issues, um, like perpetuating existing biases. Um, you know, by producing skewed data, um, the capability to craft these very intricate and convincing human narratives that can blur the, the line between simulation and reality. And the combination of these, you know, could ironically um, make these data-driven insights more credible um, in the eyes of, of decision makers. So if wargaming is to continue to play a crucial role in, um, in defense decisions, ultimately the risk is that leaders could view war as more necessary and winnable than it truly is. So we have these biased, the potential of these biased or unexplainable AI war games um, that could exaggerate chances of victory um, or misrepresent adversaries' intentions. And this could lead decision makers to believe that war is you know, potentially essential even when diplomatic options remain. Um, so in other words, you know, we're talking about ethical principles of just war theory, including just cause and just resort, and how the combination of AI and, and, and war gaming, um, you know, can really, can really affect these. So what's, what's to be done? For the seamless integration of AI and war gaming um, to yield its potential, we need to consider three things, establishing ethical standards, accountability measures, and proper oversight. So the first point, you know, it's critical that experts come together to establish ethical gui guidelines um, for both traditional and high-tech war games. And this 
includes translating how existing research ethics standards translate to, to war gaming contexts. Such guidelines need to be part of you know, government handbooks. NATO can serve as a platform for sharing best practices um, so that we can avoid you know, these, these duplication efforts. Um, second is fundamental research. So the community needs to confront the challenges of explainability, you know, this, this black box problem and the inherent biases in wargaming and AI through investment in methodology and epistemology, um, basically wargaming theory. Um, and to do that, we need collaboration across various disciplines, bringing together computer scientists, wargaming scholars, practitioners, um, international relations scholars, uh, political scientists. Um, so we need that cross-disciplinary collaboration to advance the field. And lastly, um, the institutions that are conducting and sponsoring these games must ensure that these principles are applied in practice, so they must provide oversight. Um, you know, this requires support from senior leadership. Um, if we have war games influencing policy decisions uh, without public scrutiny, um, you know, there, there might be uh, the need for additional checks and balances um, from, you know, legislative bodies such as, such as Congress. But we need to get ahead of of this problem, which we're seeing, you know, independently, these challenges that we're seeing independently in both AI and, and war gaming, which can really compound um, and have profound effects in in um, in in very effects in very profound ways. Um, so with this. Let me just briefly touch on the last scenario, which is the AI takeover. Um, so as we acknowledge the potential for integration with AI and war games, um, it is possible in the next five years that AI will completely or mostly take over. Um, there are a few reasons for this. Um, the first is, you know, just look at the investments that are going into AI. I mean, the numbers are, um, are, are really impressive. I mean, take for example, Andro Industries, which last year raised $1.5 billion. Uh, um, and, you know, we have data on the US Department of Defense spending on wargaming, which is roughly, which has been roughly 300 million um, between 2017 and 2021. The, clearly there's a lot of, a lot more money going into AI than, than into wargaming. Um, the second reason is, I mean, there, there are historical precedents for decision makers coming to prefer simulations over war games. So during the Cold War, um, you know, manual war games were overtaken by advanced operations research techniques. Um, so as policies continue to evolve and these new technologies emerge, we could envision a future where computer simulations take over from um, traditional human driven, the role of human driven war games. Um, and the third reason is that war games are falling short. Um, so take for the, for example, um, the Washington Post um, investigation last week um, on the use of war games, on the use of eight war games 
to build the campaign campaign plan for Ukraine's offensive. Um, and the scathing critique that Ukrainian military, senior military who participated in the games delivered that basically said war games didn't work. You know, you can take these methods, fold them up and throw them away. I mean, this is what the what the Ukrainians said. And the articles go into into great detail about the reasons for why war gaming fell short. The so going back to leadership expectations, um, there are all these promises and um, expectations for what war gaming can deliver: innovation, rigorous analysis, you know, better outcomes. We are not seeing that in reality. We're not. We're certainly not seeing it in Ukraine, um, and the question for what the future holds, um, I think, is is still open. Um, so, in in conclusion, um, leaders have set these ambitious visions for war gaming. Um, spur game changing innovation. Um, but current methods are falling short. Integrating AI could help revolutionize wargaming. I don't think wargaming will flourish by doing more of the same. But to reap these benefits, I mean, this means addressing some of these entrenched challenges that we talked about, trust, bias, and ethics, um, which combine when we merge both AI and war games. What we need is to establish scientific foundations and um, institutional oversight, uh, and this is vital um, as we consider how War games and AI can can integrate without amplifying these risks. So with that, um, Mike, I I thank you very much for for the opportunity and hope I've given the the audience um, some food some food for thought.